Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name, I'm the host of the St. John's Power Hour, and my name is Susan Damiani. I am the director of gift planning and also the director of the McCallum Society, which is our legacy society. So welcome. This is uh, an exciting month, uh, maybe because it relates to myself and my fellow alumni, where we're celebrating Women's History Month. Very, very important. And I'm excited to start out the month about noting um, the 100th year anniversary. And we were talking about the second wave of the 50 years uh, later of uh, modern feminism. And we have two wonderful, uh, accomplished uh, women speakers here today uh, that will share um, their expertise on this topic. Uh, I found Robin Weston. She is an award-winning uh, writer and she wrote this wonderful article in ARP and that's kind of how we got the ball rolling for today's Power Hour. And um, I'll tell you a little bit about Robin. She was born and raised in, uh, in New York City actually in Queens. We're very proud of that, Robin. Uh, and she worked as the jack of all trades. She, she worked in so many different uh, positions, which I think is great. I think that's what makes her, as you'll get to know her, so interesting. She was a typist and a sales clerk and a waitress and a bartender. Great job. Uh, waitress, I think I said, factory worker, press representative, researcher, publicity agent, editor, and teacher, and as well as for radio, television, film, before beginning her freelance writing career over 20 years ago, which would probably make you the reason why you're such an award-winning writer, because you probably, you know, in all these positions have gotten to know uh, people pretty well over the years. And uh, Robin has been awarded an outstanding writer uh, writing Emmy for ABC Daytime and received the American Women in Media's Outstanding Achievement Award by Good Housekeeping Magazine. She was also nominated for an American Society of Magazine Editors Award, the top honor in the field in the service category. And she's taught writing at Hunter College in, in New York City and the Community College of Vermont. Uh, we're very jealous. She's up at this beautiful house that she has in Vermont. Um, it's so picturesque and calm. Uh, wish we could be there with you, Robin. But Robin also lives in Brooklyn. Yay, Brooklyn. Uh, and she's the member of the American Society of Journalists and Authors and the Writers of the Guilds of America. So very accomplished. And thank you so much for taking time to be with us today. We're really honored by, by your presence. Uh, and also, we have this wonderful Women's and Gender uh, Studies program. I think I left out sexuality, right, Lara? It's mm -hmm. Women's Gender women's and Sexuality, sexuality studies. studies. Studies, thank you. Yes, there's right. an extra okay. S there. <laughs> yeah. um, we have here Professor Lara Vapnik, and she's Professor of History at St. John's College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. She holds a PhD in history at Columbia University, but she specializes in U.S. women's and gender history and in labor history. And she's the author of two books, Breadwinners, Working Women in Economic Independence, and Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, Modern American Revolutionary. Uh, so thank you as well, Lara, for um, coming on today. And I hope we can inspire our women uh, in the midst of this wonderful celebration in the month of March, and also um, gain some knowledge. Because I know for myself in, in reading the article from Robin and also doing some of my research, I have to say I still need uh, more learning, you know, being better educated on this topic as a woman. And so I hope this month we really do have a lot of great programming. So uh, after today, I hope everybody who's listening will uh, sign on for our other Tuesday uh, power hours because we really have um, some great women uh, speakers. So without ado, I'm going to turn it over to Lara and Robin and we'll begin our discussion. Thank you, ladies. 
All right, great. Um, thank you, Susan. Thank you for inviting me to participate and I'm really excited to be here and it was so much fun to read Robin's article and I'm really excited to talk to her about it. Um, so I'm just going to like launch in, ask you some questions about the article. Feel free to ask me questions about history and it's going to be kind of a free flowing conversation. Um, so I guess my first question is, um, what inspired you to write this article? Like, how did you decide that this was how you wanted to approach the centennial um, of the 19th Amendment? Because I'm assuming that that was kind of what inspired the article in 2020. I know there were a lot of sort of retrospectives about um, what did the 19th Amendment mean to women's lives? And I think it's really interesting um, that you took this kind of generational approach. So I was just interested in maybe hearing more about the genesis of the article. Well, I wish I had that kind of power as a journalist. Uh, I was assigned the article by ARP and particularly by uh, this woman, Myrna Blythe, who is, I believe, 81, 82 years old, who went to Bennington College. And um, she's quite illustrious, and she is uh, the head of uh, the media in AAP. And she's a lot, she's a, been a powerful woman for a long time. And She's seen a lot because she is 82 and um, she suggested that we take this position of looking at uh, three generations of women, which is what I was assigned to find three generations of women in a family across the country, several families representing different socioeconomic um, perspectives. And um, and we took it from there. And the article really evolved from the experiences of these families uh, across the country. And I have to say, when I was assigned the article, which took a few months to write, um, I was thrilled because um, I consider myself a feminist. And so, yeah, that's how it happened. So how did you find the families? How did you choose who was going to, who you were going to interview? Did you interview a bunch of people and then just include the most interesting ones? Or how did you kind of narrow it down? Well, I did interview several families and presented them to the editors at ARP. Um, it wasn't, you know, easy, really, because uh, three generations of women, it would have to be longevity. and. Also, you know, people get ill when they're older or they're put in, you know, in facilities. And uh, so I had to really find um, three generations of vibrant women. And um, I did it through Facebook. I did it by asking my friends and that really worked out the best. I think, you know, I'd ask my friends, they'd ask their friends. And that's often how I, I gather my uh, subjects for my articles, which I've been writing for a million years. And, you know, so, Dilga, you know. So I noticed that it was really interesting because you have, there's a lot of diversity in the people that you chose. I mean, it was interesting to hear like from an agricultural family, um, from people from the East, people from the West, people who were living in urban areas. Um, it seemed like there were people who there were black Americans, Hispanic Americans. Um, so a lot of, you know, kind of interesting differences um, in the families. But then I would say also kind of a similarity in terms of the generations in that the older generation seemed like it was sort of people maybe in like 70s to 80s range. And then the middle generation was people like in the 40s to 50s range in terms of their age. And then there were people, and then there were like children or kids, sometimes teenagers, sometimes small children. But um, I was just wondering like if you saw any, what commonalities you saw between these different stories? Like, did you see, like what themes kind of jumped out at you? Um, when you were doing the interviews and like comparing the different experiences? 
Well, first of all, um, I think in uh, three cases, the, um, the eldest generation, the women were in their 90s. Hmm. And um, that to me was really inspiring. Um, the, el the older generation, all quite articulate, um, have, were had accomplished a lot whether they were family, you know, whether it was as being the matriarch in the family or um, women who had had careers. Like um, one of these families, I actually got um, the middle generation, she was 70 uh, and her mother's 91. Her mother's, uh, the um, 70 year old woman was actually my gynecologist in Brooklyn. And her mother is a sculptor who always wanted to be a doctor and uh, had this regret of not being a doctor. Um, so I think uh, what, in terms of your question of um, a thread that went through it, I think for the eldest generation, there seemed to be a thread of not being able to achieve what they had hoped to achieve. In one case, it was like being a doctor. In another case, uh, this woman wasn't able to vote. She was um, Latinx and um, she was 90 something years old and she'd been a citizen for quite a while and she always wanted to vote but her husband wasn't ready to vote and because of her culture she couldn't vote she had to wait for him even though she worked on political campaigns and so when she did get a chance when she realized that dream um it made a, a big change in her life um, and also for my Black American um, family, uh, the, it was it was clear that you know there are limitations because of in all three generations because of race and because of what was going on in the times. So um, and yeah, I think that was basically it. Like the the eldest generation really hit the wall. And then the middle generation, which would be my generation, broke through the wall, but still had a yearning or had to overcome obstacles. Whereas the youngest generation, women in their 20s or 30s, acknowledged that they were facing different issues. Their issue um, seem to be that they're expected to do everything because they can do everything and felt the pressure of that. And that was expressed um, a few times, actually. Yeah, I, that was something that was, you actually led right into my next question, which is I think yeah, with the oldest generation, it's like we can kind of see the way in which they encountered like certain roadblocks to their professional, you know, ambitions or their ability to become educated or follow the professions that they wanted. And then I think it was interesting, a lot of women in the middle generation seem to have some of those more professionally kind of oriented careers. Um, but then I also was picking up this thread and I saw it a little bit in the middle generation, but also in the youngest generation of women sort of feeling like they could have it, in theory, they could have it all, but in reality, they couldn't really have it all. And it seemed like um, there was this real struggle that people, certain, some people, not everyone, but that some of your, um, participants were expressing, it seemed to me, and maybe I'm reading it wrong, but it was like really the struggle between kind of motherhood and career seemed like that was, you know, one of the things that um, women were wrestling with. Um, and I was just wondering if you could talk about that a little bit more. Obviously, all of these, interestingly, your two older generations, they're all mother, they're all mothers, right? Because they had to be in order in order to get yeah. three generations. Um, but I'm just interested, I guess, you know, first in that kind of like maybe that tension sometimes between motherhood um, and career and the ways that, you know, maybe different women have experienced it or solved it or not solved it. Yeah, I mean, I, as I said, you know, I think that was it that they felt um, that they had to do it all have a career and be this fantastic mother because I think now. Um, I mean, when I was raising my child, it was important to be a good mother, but it wasn't this kind of insane um, focus on motherhood your every move is being watched and you know, um, you have to really be the perfect mother. Um, 
although we all wanted to be the perfect mother. Um, and I think though the younger generation, the youngest generation is experiencing that, this strive for perfectionism in all areas of their life. So, you know, they have to be the perfect mother and at the same time, they have to really pursue their career and, you know, reach milestones in their careers. And I, I did hear that there was a lot of pressure on these women Whereas their mothers um, acknowledged that the, they were latchkey kids. I mean, they could just acknowledge it. La I mean, that was the expression latchkey kid, you leave your kid at home. <laughs> and they come and, you know, they let themselves in and stick their hamburger in the oven and, and watch television. And uh, that's, in fact, what the middle generation whose parents worked said they did. You know they just came home and watched right right and it's interesting to me because that's such a negative expression right like latchkey kids sounds like there's no mother there that you know kids are kind of on their own but i think it was it was interesting to hear people reflecting on it who had actually experienced it and some of the kids who you know were latchkey kids because like their mom was off i think working at the smithsonian yeah she was off at the smithsonian right they were like it was great you know yeah <laughs> we had so much freedom yeah i mean i think you know from what i understand you know, kids are um very hyper scheduled now and I think the middle generation, the feminists, uh, you know, people who became women in the 70s uh, had a more freewheeling childhood. And then the 60s hit, we were really ready for it because we had had some freedom as children as well. You know, I think um, it sort of went into each other. But I, I will, I do want to say that. Um, I was so impressed with the women that I interviewed and so, oh, profoundly impressed with the oldest generation. I mean, those women were amazing, are amazing. And, uh, and what also struck me was how each generation really respected their mothers, looked up to their mothers and were very quick to share what they learned from their moms. So um, that was for me also revelatory. Yeah, yeah that's, I thought I really appreciated that part of it. And I thought there were so many great quotes in the story, you know, from the older women and sort of the wisdom that they brought Ugh. to the table and shared with their daughters and granddaughters. That was really cool. Um, I'm also interested. So what did you see examples of um, mothers kind of supporting their daughters? Obviously, they inspired them, but also just like supporting them in a more like material way in terms of like helping them out that I thought was also interesting too. like were there, you know, in what ways like were the mothers kind of in what circumstances were they actually like providing support to their daughters and grand grandchildren as well? Well, I think it, you know, it's a, it was um, because of the pandemic. It's hard to say because the um, uh, in a few cases instances, the daughter, the youngest generation was living with them. In one instance, all three generations were living together, and that was because mainly because of the pandemic. So, but I did uh, find that, in fact, they they didn't necessarily support them monetarily, but they definitely supported whatever their daughter's dream was. Like no one was saying, "I want to, I want to be a musician," for example. But my mother wants me to be a doctor, in that family. Or um, so I think. I think women might feel secure enough. In my generation to support their daughters in whatever they choose to do. Whereas in my generation, my mother really wanted me to be a secretary. So I'd earn, you know, learn steno. So I'd have something to fall back on. I don't, I didn't hear that in this instance. Yeah. <laughs> well, you did end up becoming a journalist. So maybe she was, she was kind of close, even if she wasn't like exactly, yes. exactly. That's a very good typist. Right, right. That's good. Good skills to have. Um, 
I thought it was also interesting. So yeah, it's kind of, you were doing this research at an interesting moment, actually, you point out when oftentimes like the generations were living together, you know, when maybe they wouldn't have been normally. Um, I think there was also an example, I'm forgetting which family it was, where the mother had been able to like travel for work knowing that her mother would be there to watch her children. So I think those kind of like intergenerational um, networks are, are interesting to see um, the ways in which the grand, you know, the grandmothers um, are involved, I thought was was really cool. Um, I had another question. I just forgot. Oh, I can just say that was my, um, that was my, that was the um, wonderful uh, Black American family. And the, the, the eldest generation, she worked full time, but she made it very clear that the husband in that time didn't do anything. So she had to wake up in the morning, cook a meal that she would serve that night, go to work where she had a, an important position um, and come home, serve the dinner, take care of the kids and um, clean and do the laundry. Whereas her husband also worked, but really the domestic chores were firmly in her court. And I think that's changed hopefully. And that's a big change. Yeah, that was actually, and that was, you remind, that was exactly the question I was going to ask was about, you know, women <laughs> being, um, you know, responsible for all of the domestic labor in their households. Um, and just how that's changed, whether that's changed. Um, I'll ask you, I mean, <laughs> has that changed? Because I mean, you do the research and um, has that changed? I feel like it's a work in progress. I don't think it's totally changed. Um, and you know, one of the things that's been interesting to me about the pandemic is all of the discussions that we've seen about women's reproductive labor and reproductive labor, meaning not just literally like the work of reproducing, which of course also falls to women in terms of women's bodies, um, but just the work of sustaining and reproducing the next generation um, and the ways that, you know, that is still traditionally women's work. So I think there've been a lot of stories just about how difficult the pandemic has been for working mothers because they're working, you know, working often working from home, um, but still like this, like greater burden of housework and childcare tends to fall. And, and on them. right, making sure their kids are uh, learning. Right, right, making sure exactly because not just taking care of them, it's also making sure that they're, you know, homeschooling. So it's been interesting to me, you know, just as a historian who you know works on these issues to see this. I feel like this is a moment when a lot of um, a lot of types of women's labor are becoming visible, um, maybe that are that tend to be hidden, you know, at other times. And so I was also thinking about that example of the woman who went to work all day and then, you know, came, you know, cooked the meal in the morning, came home, did the laundry and like all of that and like you know, did she think of that as work or was that just, um, you know, what she had, what she had to do? I think it was just what she had to do. Right, right, right. Whereas right. what was interesting, her daughter, who was an executive on Wall Street, she then, when her daughter needed help, stepped up and would take care of her daughter's children. So her, her daughter didn't have to experience that overburden, I think. Yeah, yeah. So I think that that's really interesting. And I think, I mean, there's been a lot of scholarship on the ways in which professional women's achievements sort of like since the 70s often depends on being able to hire domestic help. And often those women who get hired for domestic positions, you know, are themselves mothers, they're migrants, people who are working um, in places like the United States and, you know, sending money back home. So there's these kind of care chains that develop. Um, so it's interesting, you know, a mother might take over that work or a father or a husband, um, but oftentimes, you know, domestic workers are called, you know, are hired to help fill in the gaps. Um, 
And that's something I think that's been, I like I say, you know, I focus on women's history and labor history, and that's an area in which there's been a lot of um, interesting new research. Um, what about the partnerships that these people have? Like, do you want to say anything more about we just have the women in this article, which of course I love, but like, what about the men? The men. Well, I know that the Smithsonian family, um, the husband, his name is Alan, he was very supportive of his wife, who was a trailblazer. She's in her 80s now, and she said she couldn't just stay home with her kids, that she felt unfulfilled. And he said, whatever you have to do, these are the latchkey kids, whatever you have to do, we'll work it out. And in fact, he did step up. I think he's a physicist. I don't, I don't remember, but he's an academic, a, a very uh, accomplished individual. And he stepped up and they worked out the scheduling. And, um, and even now when she's involved in this museum, the Lucy Bart Museum, uh, he he actually works there and volunteers there in support of his wife. So I think uh, that's cool. And um, I know my gynecologist husband uh, does a lot of did a tremendous amount of child care. He's a jazz musician and um, still does. He takes care of his grandchildren. So I think, you know, it depends upon the individual man, I imagine. But it's then it's the choice of a man where it, the woman can't just say, eh, you know. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, I think that that's, I think that that's a great point. Um, it was also interesting because, of course, you know, when historians look at the centennial of women's suffrage, like we're really focused on political activism, um, leaders of the suffrage movement, things like that. Um, these are just kind of, you know, ordinary people sort of living their lives. Um, but I was wondering about if or how the, their lives ever intersected with, you know, the feminist movement um, or other social movements. You know, that's a great question. And it isn't a, well, um, it isn't a question that I asked. Uh, however, it, it is a question I asked when it came to the Me Too movement. And I love that family. Um, the mother uh, is an artist. Uh, the daughter is a vocal teacher and a, a, a singer. And the daughter works in some kind of uh, art, but with technology in Boulder. And they all had a story to tell about um, sexual harassment. And the mother, um, of course, she was around, well, she's 80 now, but she had experienced a lot of sexual harassment on the job. And the daughter who has a son and a daughter uh, felt that uh, the, you had to be careful because, you know, it demonized um, young men and she didn't, you know, you had to be careful of that as well. I understood that. And the daughter also had um, hesitation about the Me Too movement because she had experienced um, sexual abuse, but it took her a while to speak out and she felt women needed to be supportive of women that couldn't speak out or needed time to speak out. So in that politically, and, and, and I think, I feel the Me Too movement is huge in terms of women's progress, just unbelievably huge. Um, so in that way, I discussed um, politically uh, changes, but not so much about the what I would call the second wave of feminism, which took place in the early, late 60s, early 70s. So I wonder, um, you mentioned, you know, when we talked a little bit before this conversation that you participated in the women's movement of the, I think the 70s, maybe the 60s? No, um, 70s, early 70s. Early 70s, which was really the height of that, um, you know, that, that movement. And, um, I'm just interested if you if you would if you're comfortable just telling us a little bit about um, your participation in the women's movement and in the 70s and maybe how it um, 
just re reshaped your life or your career um, and sort of, you know, where it, where it came from and like where it went? Well, you know, it was such an interesting time when I sort of came of age. So I'm 70 now. Yeah, I'm 70 now. So in 1968, which was the height of, you know, the big explosion, I was 18 and I was a hippie. You know, I experienced, I, I protested. I was opposed to the war, I protested against the war. I was a flower child. You know, I did drugs. I was like wearing long skirts and baking bread for, you know, the guys. It, you know, that was sort of the place. And it didn't dawn on me until a few years later, the early 70s, that I didn't have to serve. I didn't have to serve men bake the bread and roll their joints. You know, that I could have a power and, um, but at the same time, and this is something that occurred to me when I was writing another article, it, at the same time, it was also a time of sexual freedom. So it was a, it, it was such a confusing time because on one hand, you know, you were as a woman feeling your power, but that was also sexual power and, uh, you know, sexual freedom to be free. And then in that way, men were still, you know, um, had pow more power than women. And also, and also I wanna say that I think this generation of young women are extraordinary. And we had the phrase sisterhood is powerful, but I don't think yet we had really embodied it. I don't think we really embraced it. Um, and there was still, I mean, I can speak for myself feeling very competitive with other women. And I feel with this younger generation of women, oh my God, they're really in each other's corner. It's it's uh, making a big difference. And I, I applaud them and I'm with them. You know. That's great. Um, so it's so interesting hearing you talk about that because you know when I teach it, and of course this is, the way that we teach it is that there was the student movement in the 60s and you know women were participating but you know being asked to like mimeograph and cook and like do all of the support work and at some point they kind of turned around and said like hey you know we have something to say too we're not just here to support you do you remember like a particular turning point or was it just sort of the zeitgeist shifted like was there some particular event or moment um i do actually remember something i was in graduate school and everyone was like hanging out my living room i was the only woman there then i mean it just so happened and i was met it was my first marriage and there were all these men hanging around talking about things and i was bringing in the lasagna and, you know, coming in really, I was ba literally, as I said, baking the bread in my long paisley skirt. And, you know, I just stepped back for a minute and I, I realized I just, it was just a moment in time, like a photograph. It went deep into my consciousness that I was still my mother. You know, I was still serving the food and asking people if they wanted another drink. And I wasn't involved in the conversation and I had so much to say. So um, I think not too long after that, I got a divorce mm -hmm. because I felt I had no voice mm -hmm. in my relationship. Yeah, yeah, that's so interesting. And also interesting that part of the realization was that you were like becoming your mother and you wanted to be you know, a new woman, a yes. 1960s woman. Yes, <laughs> yeah. and it was time. Yeah, 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 that's a great, right. that's a great image. Um, I think what you say about the changes in sexuality are also so interesting. And one of the things that's interesting to me when I teach women's history is one of the things that we look at even as far back as the 19th century, like one of the first things that women organized for um, or organized against, I guess we could say, was the sexual double standard, was the idea that, you know, there were these high standards of purity for women and men could go out and do whatever they want. Um, 
And you see women kind of organizing to critique that like as early as the 1820s or the 1830s oh, really? or the 1840s. So it really goes way back. And it's interesting whenever I teach that material, my students will be like, oh, wow, this goes all the way back to the 19th century. But they will also say, you know, this is still going on today. Obviously, it's not as bad as it was in the 19th century or the 20th century, but it's not like completely it's not completely gone. Well, we can just look at health as an example of that and that women, I mean, they have for older men, they have erectile dysfunction drugs for women, nada. And uh, women are still basically in charge of birth control, even though it would be easy for men, right? So they don't, um, so I think um, in that it, it's, of course, it still continues, I have to say. Yeah. No, that's that's a really interesting that's a really interesting point. Um, let's see. And what about like, were any of these women? Do you think um, any of the women that you interviewed? Do you think they participate? Like, did they participate in marches or? I'm sorry, I didn't ask those questions. Yeah. I mean, but I have a question for you because you said you've been teaching for how many years? 15. 20, well, 15 at St. John's, but 20 altogether. So have you found a difference in women's consciousness um, during this period, of, like especially recently? Definitely. I mean, I think the Black Lives Matter movement has had a huge impact um, in terms of the ways that people are looking at history. Um, and that's been really interesting to see. So there was a really interesting confluence, I think, in 2020 between uh, the memorialization of the women of um, the hundredth anniversary of the passage of the Nineteenth Amendment, um, which granted women the right to vote. Um, so that happening at the same time as the Black Lives Matter movement happening, I think, was a pretty interesting, like, confluence of things. Of course, the pandemic was also happening, which cut short, like, a lot of the conferences and celebrations and discussions that were planned. Um, but one of the things I think that has been really interesting is to see the ways in which the story, the sort of the standard story of the women's movement has been critiqued by scholars of African American history, um, and just to think about how diversifying the story kind of changes it. Um, so that's been, that's in definitely been a big change. Well, like just in terms of, for example, like one way would be to think about um, people just kind of expanding out from sort of, I would say the traditional narrative was sort of an idea of waves, like that there was a first wave of activism around the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848 that went from there up until the passage of women's suffrage um, of the 19th Amendment in 1920. So that's sort of like the first wave. And then the second wave, which is like the, you know, upsurge that you participated in um, and then the third wave um, after that. But what people have pointed out is that by prioritizing sort of that particular history of the suffrage movement, we're leaving out a lot of women of color. So for example, um, when the 19th Amendment was passed in 1920, I mean, it said that voting rights could not be denied on the basis of sex. But at that time, um, African Americans were disenfranchised in the South. So African American men technically had voting rights, but weren't able to exercise them. And then the same became true for African American women. Um, so for African American women to actually like effectively win the right to vote, took the civil rights movement of the 1960s. So I think a lot of it has just been kind of thinking about how the women's movement interacts with other social movements and to think about how also these categories of difference interact with each other. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, um, thinking about, you know, we can't generalize. I think maybe um, 
when women's history started, say like in the 1980s, I think sometimes there were sort of generalizations about women that were really based on middle class white women. But when we diversify the story, you know, it gets more complicated. I think it gets more interesting, um, yeah. so maybe a little bit less linear. And what about the women today? I mean, what about um, the Black Lives Matter intercepting with the Me Too? I mean, that happened at the same time. So yeah, I mean, I think that's still happening. So I feel like I, I don't have like a clear oh, you don't have a historical perspective. I don't, yeah, I don't have a historical. Talk to me next year. <laughs> what about a little observation? <laughs> I think. I can't like I'm just not I feel like I'm so in the middle of it like I don't have enough perspective. I think the meat I can I do feel like now we're a little bit the me too movement is feels a little bit retrospective at this point it's not over, but it's like it feels like it felt like it kind of peaked at some point, maybe not maybe there'll be more peaks, which would be great. Um, but. What I said about the Me Too movement was again, like just people speaking out about sexual harassment, I thought was such an important development and such an important stride forward um, and kind of like dispelling some of the shame that victims feel or felt. Like, I think that seemed really powerful. Um, and again, that's something like that has such a long history um, because I found in my own research um, women's working women speaking out against sexual harassment as early as the 1880s. Wow. Know? And but it's just like it, it didn't get picked up, you know, kind of beyond the, the labor movement. Um, so I think that aspect of it seemed really significant to me. Um, I think, you know, one of the issues with the Me Too movement is the question of sort of like how deeply it's sunk in and like whether, you know, say like women who worked as waitresses were able to like claim it. Do you know what I mean? Um, it was like, I felt like um, there was a way in which it seemed a little bit more accessible to like actresses um, than it did to like women who maybe were like working in more, um, I don't know, I guess, like just different kinds of occupations. Um, it was picked up by the celebrity culture and propelled that way. And I did like I was I, I just watched the Golden Globes, I think. Uh, yeah, was it? Yes. Anyway, yesterday. And it seemed like I remembered last year it was all about women. And this year it seemed, you know, gratefully that there was a focus on uh, black Americans and their contribution uh, to the entertainment industry. So I, I hear what you're saying, but I guess we have a very, um, what, what our attention span. Yeah, a short, a short attention span. <laughs> well, a lot's happening. Yeah, no, that's true. That's true. That's true. I mean, what I think would be nice would be for people to have a long enough attention span to like think about more systemic change. Yes. Um, I think that would be great. <laughs> yeah. Well, I hope there will be. I mean, I don't know why. I guess I'm an optimist. I am an optimist and I do feel, I mean, I feel like with each of these way, oh, you don't say waves, but there are changes. They're not maybe the tremendous radical changes that plugs up the dam, you know, but uh, maybe there's less water running through it. You know, like there's some progress. There has, there's some more awareness and witnessing and willingness to, to speak up when witnessing. I mean, there's some power behind it now, right? in both aspects and in, in black lives matter and in the me too right yeah yeah no i agree i agree so just i think just the fact that these conversations are taking place is like a great first step and then i think part of the question is sort of like how do the conversations translate into like action and policy and um, yeah. how do we even keep addressing i mean i still think a huge issue for um, women is, you know, pay disparities, 
um, that still exists between men and women. Well, in both areas. I mean, yes. And also, even though there are breakthroughs through the glass ceiling, it's, it's not that many. I mean, the fact that we have to remark about a glass ceiling is the fact is proof that women are not on equal footing with men when it comes to career, when it comes to um, advancement in any mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. So does anyone have any questions? Yeah, I was just going to say we should open it up and see if anybody else has questions or comments um, who's here with us today. Well, maybe Susan will pop in. Yeah. I'm <laughs> popping on. I'm trying to go on here. Here we go. Oh, <laughs> I was trying you. to go. Hello. Thank you, ladies. That was really interesting. I feel like you were reading my mind because I was writing down questions and I checked them off because you covered almost all of them. Uh, but I do have one question for both of you. When you were talking about the progress, I think we have moved forward. Obviously, you know, pay inequities and, and so forth and the sexual harassment. We'd like to see, you know, that improve, uh, especially now in New York. Uh, we're seeing that our governor is up against uh, some claims, you know, of sexual harassment. So the Me Too is, uh, is alive and well uh, and challenging um, on what people say, you know, men say to women. Um, so I think it's still there, but I, I agree with you, Lara, with the peaks, you know, you, you feel like you hear about it, then it seems like it, it quiets down a lot. But from both your your experiences, Robin, you know, living, as you say, the wave, one of the waves, and uh, Lara, you know, teaching on the subject, are you surprised that it's taken this long to progress? And um, do you feel also, I know you talked about, I think one of the families, one of the women, I think are divorced. The divorce rate is very high. Do you think that the women's movement might have contributed to that where, you know, Robin even said, you know, I, 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 she was feeling her independence. She didn't feel like she had that in her marriage. She had had a voice. So it was time to move on. I'm divorced as well. I felt that I left my marriage for the same reason. I didn't have a voice, you know, um, I was being controlled by a man and I didn't want that. I, my mother taught me to be independent. But I don't know. Have you seen Lara in your studies about anything that that there's a correlation of that? I think um, I think the pace of change is slow, and I think thinking about it generationally is really interesting. You know, like I got my Ph. And thinking about just how long it sort of takes these things to like carry through. I mean, I got my PhD at Columbia in 2000 and I specialized in women's history um, there was no women's historian there was no historian of women and gender and U.S. history on the faculty when I was doing my graduate work by the time I was working on my dissertation there was um, a historian that was hired that specialized in women's and gender history but that didn't happen i mean and you know i mean columbia is a little slow but that was not happening <laughs> until the wow. mid to late 1990s you know so i mean i remember going into like the lounge for graduate students and there was like all these pictures of past faculty members and it was all white men you know so I don't know how I got, you know, I got interested in women's history, I think, in a way, just because it was always being left out. To me, it was like the missing part of the story, you know, so I wanted to find out more. And that's what kind of led me to it. It wasn't that I actually had anyone that was teaching it to me. Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, these things just, um, yeah, they do take time. And there is just still... You know, there still are a lot of really traditional ideas about gender roles. I mean, as much as things change, you know, there still are some ideas that take a really long, you know, some traditions that take a really long time to change in terms of what men do and what women do. Um, but I think to me, one of the really big unaddressed issues is motherhood. 
Um, and why is it the case that for women, women feel that they or women have to make this choice between, you know, career and parenthood and they're always juggling and like men don't, for the most part, don't seem to feel those pressures the same way. So yeah, I agree. I, I think, think that's a really say, big unresolved issue. I think as long as white men, as long as white men are in power, which they are now, I mean, as long as it is almost exclusively white men in power, then um, things will take time to change. And I think they are changing because as we can see in Congress now, more um, women of color and more women are coming into power. And I think that's, that will lead the way for greater and faster change. I feel like it might just, again, the optimist, be a roller coaster. Right. But here's a question for you when you bring up about men. So do you feel that up until this point of um, moving forward, as women's moves forward, have we left the men out of the conversation? Because in order for us to move forward, especially what Laura is saying with motherhood, we need resources. And obviously, if you're married, you need the help of your spouse. And if your spouse doesn't see this women's movement or this partnership, you know, how, how are we going? How are we going to change? How are women going to have the independence that they need in order to have a career when, you know, everything relies on them um, for the for the caretaking of, of their child. So is there a way that we need to involve the women, uh, the men in the conversation and have them just as responsible for the women's movement as women? I think we need to involve the men, but we also need some public resources devoted to things like childcare. So I just mm -hmm. think part of the no, issue in the United mm -hmm. States is that it all falls to the individual. There's no social, there's very right. few social resources um, devoted to nurturing children. And that's part of the reason it all falls onto individual families and then falls onto women's shoulders. So mm -hmm. I think, you know, like some more childcare options would be a great start. What about with the pandemic? Has, has, do you think that might change with, uh, maybe more companies find seeing that, you know, uh, employees working from home might be a cost effective <laughs> way and so maybe that might you know enable women to have a little more flexibility in their careers i think I that know. i don't know i think that mm. just that there's more put on the women but what right. i want to yeah. say mm -hmm. again, uh, as we look at congress changing in terms right. of more women there that maybe there will be laws passed for child care more mm -hmm. money given um to do we have policy put in place so that right. we have more freedom? I, I, I think that's the only way to do it. I'm sorry to say, mm -hmm. yeah. but legislation is what moved the women's movement along. I mean, it was the changes in laws, the voting, the uh, um, Roe versus Wade, uh, various uh, legislations that that um, initiated the pro or cemented the progress. I right. Think. Uh, I think like, that's really, I think that's really true. And I think when you mm -hmm. look at how, like, where I see change over time happening is when you get this confluence between sort of social movements and, you know, people being mobilized and then also like having a government that's ready and willing to act and to do something. So I think it's not just bottom up or top down, but it's like where those things meet in the middle that mm -hmm. real historical change takes place. And like you said, Robin, with the Congress, you know, with more women in Congress, because in terms of progressing, um, you know, I still, every time I have to go for a mammography, <laughs> I'm always like, how, this is still the same machine <laughs> for how many years? They never, they they never have a machine like it. that for a man, believe me. I know, they never change. And I'm like, I don't <laughs> understand this. Has anyone, you know, looked at this? So. You know, and, and like you said, you know, taking care of a child, I mean, maybe there's some daycare centers, but other than that, it really falls on uh, the immediate family. And, and like you were saying, Robin, when you were talking to some of these women that their mothers were, were helping them with child uh, 
care. So none of that, has, nothing creative has really come out for a really long time. So let's hope, and, and I agree, Robin, when you're saying the, the younger generation of, of women today, I really do admire them. Uh, and I think they will definitely, if you want to talk about waves, bring another wave on. We need I it. Am so we need it. In, I am so in the corner of this <laughs> younger generation. I am in their corner. And anyway, I can step back and support <laughs> them. I exactly. I agree, well, that, I, like to I agree hear. with you. That's yeah. like the best thing about teaching right now is just getting to interact with women, young women and men, like of college age, because they're really changing the world. And so it's really exciting to, I learn a lot from them, you know. And well, the I hope this month things. with celebration of women uh, that we can bring together our alumni and our students, uh, female students together uh, for that support. Because I know back in the day, I felt that there was competition between women. I agree with what Robin was saying. But I think now I don't see it like like we used to, and and that's important. That's the only way you move forward if you're all together, you know, helping each other. So let's see if we have. Um, I think we may have some comments. Uh, I know someone just said, "Wow, I went to college earlier than Lara, and we had a women's history major." But I went to you. a women's college. Yeah, I went to Barnard <laughs> and there definitely was a women's history major. But then when I went across the street to <laughs> Columbia, <laughs> things changed on the other side of Broadway. <laughs> um, and also, th thanks for the, the conversation they just they just wrote. Um, let me just see, Sue, I don't know if your if your audio is off. I know you can see the chats better see. than let me. me. See. Do we have anyone that's left a question in the chat? Hmm, I did not see any questions come through. Okay. Do you have, both of you have any um, comments or thoughts about Women's History Month since we're celebrating this month? I'll leave that to Laura. <laughs> <laughs> It's been interesting to me to see like all the places it pops up in the funniest places. It's like Women's History Month exercise class. It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> um, know. you know, I'm all for it. I mean, obviously, right. you know, I study it all year, but I think mm -hmm. to have a month that shines a light on it, sure, why not? You know, right. I'm I'm all for anything that like brings more attention to women's history and. Like I say, I think this is like, it's a really interesting time to study women's history. I mean, hi historically we're living in this watershed moment with the pandemic. So suddenly I think all, all history feels maybe more, I don't know if it's more relevant. I mean, history to me is mm -hmm. always relevant, but I feel like people are looking to history to try to understand the present because the present is so confusing. Um, mm -hmm. So maybe history, uh, you know, has seems more relevant than it has at certain other points. Um, one thing that I think is just fantastic about women's history right now is just like the tremendous diversity of work that's being done and all the ways in which it's like opening up our understanding of the past, like all of the work that's being done on suffrage, um, especially. Um, but I think, you know, there's always there's always more work to be done. And so I think the pandemic is probably going to open up a whole host of new questions, maybe about gender and public health. Um, there's you know, going to sure. be a lot more to come. I hope so. Would you like to share um, with our viewers about your program at St. John's? Me? Yes, Laura. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm in the history department um, and I also, I do offer classes that are included in the women's gender mm -hmm. and sexuality um, minor. And I also have, are you, I also have a speaker who's coming in on Thursday during common hour, which is 150 to 315. Actually, I could, I could paste it in the chat. Yeah, please um, do. And that is um, Kate LeMay, who is a senior historian at the National Portrait Gallery. And she is going to be talking about her um, 
an exhibit that she curated called Votes for Women, A Portrait of Persistence. I just put it in the chat. I hope everyone can see it. Do um, you guys see it there? No. No, it's in pop-up. Oh. I I'll share it with everyone. Okay, cool. Yeah, so that's gonna be really interesting. Um, and so she's somebody Great. who I think like her, the big exhibit that she did at the National Portrait Gallery is just a great example of how the history of the suffrage movement has been diversified and like how the story changes when we include black women and women of color. Um, so it should be a really, it should be a really interesting event. So Sounds yeah, very everyone's interesting. welcome to join. Um, great. Advanced registration is required. So if you're interested, please do register. Yeah, everyone will receive a, a follow up email. So be sure to share okay. that program with everyone. Okay. I see we're we're up for time. Uh, any last minute uh, words from our speaker? Well, I guess I want to say sisterhood <laughs> is powerful. <laughs> And exactly. I am envisioning a world of equality in every corner, in every aspect of humanity and on this planet. I'm envisioning that. And I I welcome everyone to join me in that. And thank you so much for love this. Love it. Love it. Thank you. Beautiful. Well said. <laughs> Laura, we have you on mute. Um, yeah, that's a great, go. that's a great image yeah. done with. Thank you, Rob. Totally. <laughs> totally. You. Well, thank you. And thank you for sharing um, your article with us. It was uh, very interesting. I loved reading about all the different generations and is it, it was inspiring and, and uplifting to hear their stories. And Lara, thank you. And thank you for all the great work that you do at St. John's empowering our future women uh, and let's, like you said, continue that positivity and let's uh, hope, you know, like Robin said, envision the equality for, for all. That would be super. Well, thank you again. Thanks for everyone for joining us. We really appreciate it. And please uh, check out our other Power Hours coming up every Tuesday, uh, especially for Women's History Month. We have uh, a great program for you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>